Right, let's look at some examples. Now, in the nature of examples that have to fit onto one slide each, these are all a bit artificial, but they should get the points across. So, have a look at this. What do you think this prints? Pause if you need to. It prints drive drive twice, because bike and car simply inherit the drive implementation from vehicle. It's perfectly fine to send the drive message to a car or to a bike because they have one, they inherit it. But they don't do anything to change it, and so what happens when you do that is exactly what would have happened if you had sent that same message to a plain old vehicle. Now what about this one? This one is going to print roll roll and pedal pedal because in this case each of bike and car override vehicles drive implementation with their own and then that is the one that's used when you send the message drive to a car and to a bike respectively. What about this one? This one is going to print drive drive and pedal pedal. Let's see why. Car's drive method overrides the drive method of vehicle which it inherits but then all it does is simply call the one it inherits and so that makes no difference. So the car's one is just going to call drive drive. Pedal pedal is like it was before. It, it does in fact override it to do something different. So I suppose this is just demonstrating the super dot drive notation that we see there in the car class. So how do you go about deciding when one class should inherit from another? Well, one of the things that you do is you look out for objects that are appearing in your description of the domain that have common attributes and behaviours and that satisfy this is a relationship. That's the key thing. So if two classes just happen to have common attributes and behaviours but they actually mean different things in the two classes, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in classes that really satisfy this is a relationship. You can pit design then a class that represents that common state and behaviour and satisfies that is a relationship. Um, you can decide whether a subclass needs method implementation specific to this particular subclass type um, and you can go on and do this at various levels. You can carry out further abstraction by looking for groups of subclasses that might themselves have common behaviours. Now, let's have an, another look at our student implementation. We've got three private attributes there, first name, last name and matric, and we've got a constructor, and we've got three public getters to get those private attributes. Now, if we try to implement a UG extending the student um, and add a new private attribute tutor group, initialising it to the empty string, then we can have a new method that sets it and a new method that gets it and we can override the toString method, we hope, like that and print out all of that information. Now, what's going to happen when we try that? It won't work. It won't work because first name, last name and matric are all private. So, you saw before that we could use the protected access modifier to get around that, but actually often a better style is to use the getter functions that are already provided um, because that works perfectly fine and then you can leave the data private and you can have your subclass access that private data just like any other object from any other class would by using the getter methods. Or we could use protected like we saw before. Uh, so, I think we're labouring this a bit, aren't we? We said all this. Private instance variables cannot be directly accessed by the subclass. They can be accessed by setter and getter methods inherited from the superclass, if we like, or indeed they're simply available usually because they're just public. Um, protected instance variables still hidden from other classes, but accessible by the subclasses. Um, watch out for this if your class is going to end up in a library because that can actually cause um, some difficulty Your your... Um, your behaviour might not work if people override your protected members in a way that you're not happy with and then you might get the blame. So usually speaking it's safer to keep your data private and access it in subclasses via the setter and getter methods. Which then are kind of protected appropriately. You make sure that people can't damage objects of your class using the setter and getter methods. 
Now we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about the object superclass, which is the ultimate superclass of all classes in the um, in the Java JDK. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, um, but if you are looking in your IDE, um, you will find that it will helpfully autocomplete for you. So if you write a piece of code which involves an object reference to a thing of type family doctor, and then you go gp dot like that, then you can get yourself a pop-up that gives you all the methods that you could then invoke on such an object reference, all the messages you could send to a family doctor. And some of these will be specifically from your family doctor class, and others will be inherited from further up the Java hierarchy. Um, and in the Java hierarchy, um, you certainly have at least the object class, which we're now going to talk about in a bit. Um, you can go and have a look at the, um, at the Java API documentation for more information about this stuff. Um, by the way, we have URLs here for various different versions of Java, and I haven't always updated it, so this happens to be a reference to Java 11. You'll also see references to Java 8 and Java 15. There's usually no significance in that number, it's just a case of when the slide was last edited. Okay, so going back to our doctor class again, remember this was the super class in our hierarchy that we were designing. Actually, it isn't the top because any class in Java extends the class whose name, somewhat confusingly, is object. So if a class doesn't explicitly extend some superclass, then it implicitly extends object, and so transitively every class extends object. So you never need to write extends object, it's always understood. And the class object defines methods that should be available to every object of every class. And here are a few examples. So every object understands the equals method, which takes an, another object as argument and returns a boolean based on whether the object that is receiving the equals message is or is not the very th the is or is not equal to the object that's being passed as an argument to it, which usually will mean they should have the same class and also encapsulate the same data. Uh, we also have um, hash code available on every object. You've seen already that every object understands toString, at least in a basic way, and we talked about um, overriding the toString meth method in order to do something sensible for your own classes. Uh, yes, so you've already been doing it. I think we said that in passing when we wrote the toString methods before. Okay. So, objects instances of classes. Okay, so objects are instances of classes created at runtime. Each object has a compile time type, um, which is essentially it's the same kind of thing as a class. Ob classes are not exactly types, but classes define types, and for most purposes you can think of them as being synonymous in Java. You create an object using the new keyword, and then a constructor is invoked to actually initialize the data of the object. Uh, you access objects using reference variables, so objects are reference types in Java. They live on the heap memory rather than on the stack, so you always create them using new and that grabs memory off the heap um, rather than from the stack of a particular method call, for example. Um, and in order that they don't grab memory and keep it forever, they are automatically destroyed by a garbage collector when there are no longer any references to them existing in your program. We've now seen as well that they derive from the superclass object and that they inherit some default methods like toString, equals, and hash code. But when you have a whole sequence of classes related by inheritance, how does the process of creating an object actually work? Well, to understand that we have to know a bit about constructor chaining. So all constructors in the inheritance tree have to run when a new object when a new instance is created. So suppose we're in this situation. We have a class family doctor, which inherits from doctor, which inherits, as every class must if it doesn't inherit from something else, from object. Okay. Now when we create an object of class family doctor, we're going to want all the data that lives in doctor or in object to get properly initialized before we claim to have a fully initialized family doctor object. So what this is going to do is going to work like this. So each constructor, either implicitly or explicitly, invokes a constructor of its direct superclass as the first thing it does. So that by the time the constructor does anything else, all aspects of the object that are defined in any superclass of the one where this constructor is living have been properly defined already. 
only object has no direct superclass, so that's where this process stops. How do we make sure that each constructor invokes a constructor of the direct superclass as the first thing it does? Well, we can do it explicitly using the syntax super with some arguments. So you can, if you get in some arguments to your own constructor, you might want to pass some or all of them onto a superclass constructor. Conveniently, you don't have to do it explicitly if you're in the sort of most common default case, which is to say that the constructor you want to invoke for the superclass version of your object is just the plain no argument constructor. Essentially, the compiler automatically inserts super with no arguments as the first line of your constructor in that case if you haven't invoked super with some other collection of arguments in your constructor code. However, of course, if there is no no argument constructor, you'll get a compile time error. Recall that the Java system will create you a no argument constructor, but only if you haven't yourself created any constructors. If you've created a constructor with, a, with arguments, and you also want there to be a no argument constructor, which you usually should, then you will need to create the zero argument constructor explicitly. And as we said, the constructor call must always be the first instruction in the body of the constructor. So let's see an example. So here is our student class, as before, and we've, we're omitting the methods for now because that's not so important right now. And our UG class is going to extend student. Um, we are just now showing the inside of the UG class, I think, here. So we've got a private string tute group. Um, and here is our constructor. Um, and as the first line, we're going to invoke the um, the superclasses constructor, so we're going to invoke the constructor of class student using these same three arguments that were passed, three of the four arguments that were passed into our constructor here. And then once the student part of the object has been properly created, at that point we're going to set the final um, piece of data that's specific to the UG object. We're going to set the tutor group to the tutor group argument that we had passed in. Let's practice some more. 